Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Voices for Change radio show, the weekly talk show hosted by filmmaker Tracy Schott, producer and director of the award-winning documentary, Finding Jen's Voice, which brings to light the reality of intimate partner violence. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of Tracy's show on our incandescent radio network and incandescent TV. Today, Tracy's guest is internationally renowned activist, Dr. Jackson Katz, PhD a man who has made headlines, movies, and written books on issues of gender, race, and violence. Jackson has been a longtime major figure and thought leader in the growing global movement of men working to promote gender equality and prevent gender violence. He is the co-founder of the multiracial mixed gender program, Mentors in Violence Prevention. It is one of the longest running and most widely influential gender violence prevention programs in North America and beyond. Today's topic, the role of men in ending intimate partner violence. We know you will be intrigued and fascinated by the stimulating, important conversation. So take it away, Tracy. So welcome to the Voices for Change podcast. So we'll get started. I wanna start with your book, The Macho Paradox. In the first chapter, aptly titled Violence Against Men is a, uh, Violence Against Women is a Men's Issue, you write, we can provide services to the female victims of these men until the cows come home. We can toughen enforcement of rape, domestic violence, and stalking laws, and arrest and incarcerate even more men than we currently do, but this is all reactive and after the fact. It is, it is essentially an admission of failure. You go on to say, for us to have any hope of achieving historic reductions in an incidence of violence against women, at a minimum, we will need to dream big and act boldly. I love that. It needs to be the title of your next book. It's great. It's a great thing. So um, I want to I want to say ask you, you know, to talk to us about what that means. What's it mean to dream big and act boldly in the context of viewing domestic and sexual violence as a men's issue. How does that reframe make a difference? Sure. Well, first, let me say thank you very much, Tracy, for having me on your show. I think you're doing great work and it's, it, you know, it's a great, it's a great, you know, pr honor and, 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 and privilege for me to be working with you on this and hope thank you very much for organizing this. This is, this is important stuff. And, um, and, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. Um, boy, um, or girl, um, uh, the reframe is, is, is so incredibly important because, um, for example, identifying domestic violence or sexual assault or sexual harassment as a women's issue is what I refer to as a, a subtle form of victim blaming. It shifts the accountability, it shifts the conversation, it shifts everything onto the shoulders of, of women rather than the people, men, who are doing it to them, if you will. So it's, it's subtle but profound. It's a subtle but profound way of the group frankly, with more power, um, shifting accountability and responsibility onto the group with less. Now, I understand there's, you know, there's domestic and, and violence and intimate partner violence committed by, you know, women, by people who are not men, but the vast majority of it is done by men. The vast, in heterosexual relationships, the vast majority of serious and, you know, and, and whether it's coercive control or serious, uh, you know, uh, intentional with, with injury or, action with intent to harm is done by men against women. And um, and yet so many people see these issues as women's issues. I mean, uh, I'll, get a, I'll give you another example, rape and sexual assault. Men commit the overwhelming majority of rape, uh, whether the victims are, uh, are, are women or men or uh, people who don't fall into the binary, the, whether the victims are people of varying genders, the perpetrators are overwhelmingly men. So why do we call rape a, a men's issue? I mean, excuse me, a women's issue. And again, the, the subtle but profound shift in our thinking about, okay, what do we do about it? If we think it's a women's issue, then we focus on women. If we think it's a women's concern, then women are the ones who have to solve the problem. Right. And yet men continue to have the vast majority of social, political, and economic power, both in our society and all over the world. The people, in other words, who have the most power to make the changes that have to be made institutionally, politically, socially, religious institutions, everything. The people who have the most power are the ones who are saying it's not really our issue. Meanwhile, members of our group, if our means men, have the enormous and disproportionate amount of power and influence, and yet we're not even identifying ourselves as, you know, sort of accountable 
centrally on this matter. So in, in short, in, in, that's a long way of saying, and the, the short way of closing off this answer is, if we shift the, the verbiage and the language and the concept to say, this is about men and masculinities, this is about male dominated cultures and how they're operating. And um, as opposed to, this is something that's happening to women. If, if we say it's something that's being perpetrated by men rather than it's happening to women, then we'll be able to hold accountable those individuals and institutions that have the most power to make changes. And honestly, the changes that have to happen are structural and deep. There, this is not just about running from one perpetrator to the next and asking what happened to him? Why did he get, you know, what did he go wrong? Why was he a broken man? Did he have a drinking problem? Did this guy have a, a problem when, you know, adjusting to adult life? Uh, uh, did he have, did this guy lose his job? And why did he go off and kill his family? Are, are you kidding me? These are much deeper issues than individual pathologies that are surfacing. And unless we want to play whack-a-mole the rest of our lives, running from one incident to the next and trying to you know put out these little prairie fires, uh, we're kidding ourselves if we're going to do that. If we want to go to the structures and the deeper underlying belief systems that support those structures, these are the kind of conceptual changes we need to make. So let's let's talk some more about that. Um, there's there's a couple of things that come to mind as you're talking about a lot of its linguistics, you know, like we kind of start with just the language that's used. Um, you know, I you know, in your book, you talk about, you know, the, the difference between, you know, she was raped versus he raped her. Um, you know, it. it it's it, it's such a path the, the passive tense makes a huge difference in how we even look at domestic violence. Right. Pa the passive language is central, right? Because language structures thought. So part of what I've been arguing for a long time is that we need this paradigm shift in our thinking, a new way, a new conceptual framework that app applies to all these issues, domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, a whole range. Le the, the language that we use currently keeps us in the old paradigm. And I'll give you a handful of examples. You've already given a good example, but I'll give you a handful of examples of the kinds of language that people use, mostly unconsciously. It's not like they're intending to use passive language to keep us in old calcified ways of thinking, but that's how it works. Um, you'll hear people say things like, how many women were raped on college campuses last year? rather than how many men raped women on college campuses last year. You'll hear people say things like, how many girls in this school district were sexually harassed last year, rather than how many boys sexually harassed girls, or how many girls sexually harassed girls. You'll hear people say things like, in one state or another, how many teenage girls in this state got pregnant last year, rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. In each case, you know, the use of passive language has a very powerful political effect, and the political effect is the shift in focus off of the group with more power onto the group with less. I mean, even the term violence against women is a term that I don't use. And you know, what's missing from the term violence against women? Well, the active agent is absent. Violence against women is a bad thing that happens to women, but nobody's doing it to them. They're just experiencing it, kind of like the weather, you know? But if you insert the active agent, men, you, which you have a new phrase, and men's violence against women, it doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate, it's more mm -hmm. honest, and you know, how do you solve a problem unless you're willing to name it? And let me also say, Tracy, I appreciate that a lot of women in the domestic and, and sexual violence fields, in a, in a multiracial, multiethnic sense, and this is global, not just local, or, you know, to the U.S. But a lot of women, even in the field of domestic and sexual violence, don't want to use active language, like say men's violence against women rather than violence against women, because they know that a lot of men get defensive in the face of that honest language. Right. And and a lot of these women don't want men to be defensive because they have to work with men collaboratively, whether it's, you know, in professional settings, whether it's with law enforcement, which is still dominated by men, however much progress women have made right. in politics. You don't want to be seen as the quote unquote angry feminists. So therefore, a lot of the women in the field will use this gender neutral language, even though they know that the overwhelming majority of the violence is done by men, the overwhelming majority of the victims are women. And I yeah, there's, there's kind of an a, a apologetic um, stance that um, women take when they're talking about um, men's violence against women. You know, it's like, no, we know it's not all men. We're not saying it's all men. Right. Don't get defensive. It's not your right. fault. We're not holding right. you personally accountable for That's this right. girl being raped. There's like you start there. So like, you know, they, 
you know, the, the man you're talking to can just sit back and let it not, you know, it doesn't, this doesn't affect me. That's right. And, and, and honestly, that's one of the reasons why the more men speak out on these matters, it takes the pressure off of the women who feel like it's not worth saying these things or being direct about it because of the, because of their understandable and realistic fear of blowback or pushback or backlash. The more men say it, I mean, yes, we're going to get some backlash too. I mean, I'm not saying that all men jump up, you know, for joy when they hear me speak about this subject, but, but we can take a lot of the pressure off of those women, you know, and, and, and we can have a more honest conversation. I mean, the goal of this is to have an honest conversation, right? So, and so let me just say to, in case there's, you know, for men listening or women who have men close to them who are listening, Men can handle the truth, okay? We can handle, I've been working with men for 40 years. You know what I mean? I mean, my colleagues and I in all these racially diverse settings with all the branches of the military, sports culture, I work in blue collar workplaces and in, you know, C-suites with, you know, finance executives, all, and everybody in between. Men can handle the truth. Now, some men are gonna come in defensive, you know, we're just gonna be bashed again with, this is just, you know, man hating session or whatever. It's so predictable it's embar i'm embarrassed by this as a man but yet if you get beyond that immediate and initial and reflexive defensiveness men men understand that's what's going on most men know that that there's an awful lot of men who are assaulting women who, who are misogynists who are acting out in various ways maybe they don't have an analysis a deeper analysis institutional political but they I mean, this is so obviously a fact that, you know, the Me Too movement, for example, didn't come as a surprise to anybody who had been minimally paying attention, right? Yes, it gave a voice to, especially to young women because of the technologies of communication and it, an incredible, you know, I mean, it was a, you know, the Me Too movement was, is an incredible, you know, sort of shift that's happened as facilitated by the technologies of communication and the digital revolution. But anybody who was minimally checked in before the Me Too movement knew that Domestic and sexual violence were pervasive problems in the world. And that group of people who were minimally checked in included men, okay? So the, the question really is going forward is how do, you, how do you navigate the spaces where men are gonna be defensive, but still boldly go to those spaces and don't just completely retreat because some men will be hostile, defensive, in denial. This is, by the way, one last thing. This is very similar to racism and working with white people on issues of racism. Of course, there's lots of white people who are going to get defensive when you start talking about, you know, white privilege, you're talking about the ways in which unconscious bias operates on a daily basis, whether it's in the workplace or even on daily in daily life. But white people with integrity have to say, you know what, I have a responsibility. If I say I claim to care about justice, racial justice, these American ideals of inclusivity and 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 fairness, then I have a responsibility to go into the, some of those spaces that are uncomfortable. It's exactly analogous to men and sexism. It doesn't mean you're a bad person if you're a man. It just means that you have a responsibility to think about how you as a man help through your actions or your silence to perpetuate a system of injustice, unfairness, and inequality and a system that results in the brutality by some of the, some of our you know group if you will men against women and children and other men every single hour of every single day in every country all over the world in an ongoing fashion and i i know a lot of men who don't want to be part of that they don't want to participate in perpetuating that and engaging them and challenging them is the goal of my work so, you know, it's, I've had a lot of conversations um, since I started doing this film um, and then in the last year, talking about first male privilege and then white privilege, right? I, and, and there are some men in my life who I, who I adore in, in many ways, but when those words come up, the walls go up and they become so defensive how do you break through that? How, what, 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 what are the tricks? What, how, how do I have this conversation without them feeling attacked? <laughs> this is the huge, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, and I'm not sure I can do it full justice in, in the context of the time that we have together, because it's a, this is a huge challenge, you know? There's no magic bullet answer, if you will. Um, to use a you know a violent metaphor, Look, violence is just shot through literally shot through our language, our consciousness, our our culture. Hey, be a filmmaker, right? 
Yeah. Like, yes. I thought I was, I'm doing, I'm doing the film and working with survivors and like, where are we going to shoot this? Right. And, real, and realizing I'm talking to a survivor of, of a gun shooting, you know, and I'm like, yeah, that, right. that language I, has got to stop. I hear you. I hear you. But one answer, Tracy, one way to think about this is, is something that I've embedded in my, you know, my teaching and my, you know, in my programs that I run and, and in my public speech speeches, and, you know, in all lots of different places, right? A, a friend and colleague of mine, Michael Kaufman, um, who was one of the co-founders of what's called the White Ribbon Campaign, which is the largest public demonstration of men speaking out about men's violence against women, wearing a white ribbon as a symbol of that, speaking out in the late in late November, early December, all over the world. It's like 60 something countries who, who do this regularly. Um, the White Ribbon Campaign. Michael Coppin wrote a piece, a, an article in 1987 called The Triad of Men's Violence. And in that piece, he connected men's violence against women men's violence against other men and men's violence against themselves. They're all connected. So sophisticated people in the 21st century don't just think, well, you know, men's violence against women is a big issue, but it's not connected to other forms of violence. And, you know, they're all connected. And so, so here's, here's one way that like I frame this at least sort of rhetorically to, to, to think about the connections. The same system that produces a you know, 20 year old college student who rapes his fellow college student after a night of, you know, partying is the same system that produces a 29 year old man who beats up his pregnant wife because he's filled with anxiety about her shifting her focus from him to the, you know, the growing, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, fetus within her is the same system that produces a 37 year old corporate executive who sexually harasses his, um, his colleague or his subordinate is the same system that produces a 56 year old white guy in the in the mountains of Utah who goes out into the you know to the woods and shoots himself in the head kills himself the same system in all of these cases is producing these outcomes and the system relates to how do we define manhood how do men how are men trained to think about themselves and taking care of themselves it's it's a, it relates to emotional literacy and men's ability to understand the range of their emotional experiences and not just take every every emotion like grief, sadness, disappointment, and translate it into anger. It's it's about sexual entitlement and how we train we train boys from the earliest ages that they're entitled to sexual access to women's bodies and violating women's bodies. That's not genetically programmed into the male. That's taught into that's taught and boys absorb it. These are all ideologies and beliefs about manhood that connect to all of these kinds of violence. And by the way, suicide, the fastest growing um, category of suicide is men over the white men over the age of 50 killing themselves with guns. And you know, two thirds of the gun deaths in this country every year are suicide. Uh, and most of the most of the people who kill themselves by gun are men. And again, white men over 50 are disproportionately uh, affected. So I would say one way one point of empathy with men is like, yes, men's violence against women is a really important problem, and we're not going to minimize that, but it's also connected to all these other forms of abuse and violence. And like, for example, men are the primary victims of most forms of violence, with the exception of sexual and domestic. Men are the primary, for, uh, primary victims of uh, uh, assault, aggravated assault, uh, murder, attempted murder, um, um, bullying, gay bashing. So by, 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 by making men aware that you are connecting even their own experience of, of abuse and violence, and, and men know, by the way, men know how, I mean, I'm writing a book right now about masculinities and violence. Men know how much violence shapes their psyche, how much fear they have of other men, not of women, but of other men. And if you make those connections for, for them and say, wait a second, we're not, we're talking about a whole system. We're not talking about individuals as much as we are talking about a system. And that if you care, if you have compassion for other men, including yourself, but also your sons, not just your daughters, because we, because I, I often say, I said this in my TED talk, you, we, we adult men have responsibility, not just to women, we, we do have that. And not just to our daughters, we do have that, but to our sons, because we're, we're handing off a, a world, incredible level of, with incredible levels of violence and fear. And that's our responsibility. And how are we gonna equip them better as young men to navigate these the complexities of our society in the 21st century 
And, you know, by saying it like that, like we're challenging them in a positive way rather than pointing our finger at them. Right. That works. You know, and it, it, I've always, you know, I've always said, you know, saying that, that there is such a thing as male privilege, that there is such a thing as white privilege, doesn't mean that I'm accusing you of racism or sexism. I'm saying that it's, it's structurally built into our society. Um, and, you know, you do a, a wonderful job in your book of, of kind of examining those various uh, constructs in our society, um, including um, uh, pornography, and sex trades and um, just how violent um, that has all become. It's, you know, it's, it's not your grandfather's uh, playboy anymore. No, no. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that, that you cover in your book that I, that I think are um, uh, worth a whole series of conversations. Um, but I, I think I would like to come back to this thought about boys and um and you know young men and and i know that you've been working for many years in university settings um and beyond and teaching uh, young men about um uh prevention you have a program that you uh co-developed um called the bystander program right um, well, the, the MVP program, Mentors and Violence Prevention Program, that employs the bystander approach. We were the we were the first program. We introduced the bystander approach to the field of sexual assault and relationship abuse prevention education. So, can you tell us a little bit about that program and how it was developed and how um, you know we can actually use that in our families, communities, workplaces? Sure. Um. In brief, again, in brief because yeah. it's a longer story to tell. Um, in the early 90s, I was uh, you know, in grad graduate school in Boston and uh, I approached the director of this institute at Northeastern University called the Center for the Study of Sport in Society. And the institute had been created with the idea of using sport as the vehicle for social activism around a range of issues, but mostly race and racism. You know, And anybody who's paid attention knows how important sports is in social change. And I knew this, I knew the history, the 20th century history of how important sports was in struggles for both racial justice and, and, and gender equality and LGBT rights and everything else. And I knew all about this. And I thought, okay, where are we gonna find men, especially young men who are, who are willing to stand up and speak out on the issues of domestic and sexual violence? Cause I, you know, in my, you know, young, adulthood, if you will, when I was in college and young adult, I was one of the only men ever in my, you know, settings. And I was certainly, you know, ahead of the curve, I appreciate, but it was like, why aren't there more men? We need more men. It's obvious to me that this is the missing piece. Women's leadership has been incredible in a multiracial, multi-ethnic sense. It's world changing. It's, it's ongoing, but where are the, where are the men? And so I, I thought if we go into the sports culture where guys already have some status, not just within the insular athletic subculture, but in the larger campus culture, if we get guys with status to speak up, it'll make up make it easier for other guys. Because my 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 I've been convinced for a long time there's an awful lot of men who are uncomfortable with and unhappy with the status quo of men of men's abuse of women, but they don't speak up because they know that there's a cost to pay if you speak up and you get police back into conformist silence often. And a lot of guys like just put their head down. So I'm thinking, okay, sports. And we, got, we ended up getting the, the, the director of the Institute, Richard Lapchick, liked the idea. We, we worked together to you know, write a grant. We got funded by the United States Department of Education to create this model program, which we did. The question was, what are we going to do? We had nine colleges and universities ranging from big you know, public universities like University of Nebraska, University of Kentucky, all the way to small liberal arts schools in New England. The question was, what are we going to say to these young men on football, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, wrestling teams? And it was initially only men, young men, right. and male, you know, athletic male, the male side of the athletic department. Um, what are we going to say that invites them into the conversation rather than indicts them as potential rapists and abusers? And I say invite rather than indict, which is a quote from Esther Solar, the founder of the Futures Without Violence, important organization in uh, San Francisco. Invite rather than indict, because back in the 70s and 80s, prior to this period that I'm talking about, 
most efforts on college campuses and in communities that focused on men focused on them as perpetrators or potential perpetrators. So the spirit of the educational message to men was, you know, you better listen up. You better know that when you're in your in a relational conflict, if you're starting to get worked up, you need to figure out how to de-escalate because if you keep getting worked up, you might cross the line into actually committing an act of domestic violence or in sexual assault situations, if you're having sex, sexual relations with somebody and you keep pushing and you're not sure if they're fully consenting and you keep pushing, then you could be crossing the line into committing sexual assault. And the problem with focusing on men in that way as perps or potential is that most men don't identify as that. And they, they in some cases, resent the implication that just because they're men, they are potential perpetrators and they shut down. And so my thinking was, okay, how do we break through this and be inclusive and, 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 and get guys to buy in. And I'll, 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 I'll get to the bystander thing right now. I had a professor in graduate school who along with his colleagues was looking at an approach to middle school bullying prevention that moved beyond the perpetrator victim binary. Instead of focusing on the kid doing the bullying and the kid experiencing it, they focused on everybody around the kid doing it and everybody around the kid experiencing it. The goal was to get everybody in a given peer culture engaged, including people around the perpetrator to make it clear to that kid, what he or she was doing was not okay, not because they were gonna get in trouble with the law or the authority figure like the teacher or the principal, but because the peer culture was gonna police itself and make it clear to that kid that what you're doing is wrong and unacceptable and we're not impressed by this and you can't do this, stop it and getting people around the victim or the target to say to, to that person, we're on your side, what can we do to help you, this is wrong. And again, the beauty of that is that everybody had a role to play. And what we did by bringing that into the sexual assault and domestic violence prevention field was we gave an, it gave us an answer to men who say to this day, this isn't my issue. I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a good guy, uh, this is a problem. Yeah, I agree it's a problem, you know, but it's not my problem. And, 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 and so it was a way to speak to that guy and say, you know what? It's all of our problem. And if you yourself aren't abusive to women, but you don't make it clear to men around you that 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 you're not OK with even the, you know, misogynist comments, because we know that there's a, you know, the violence takes place on a pyramid. The tip of the pyramid is an incident of sexual assault or domestic violence. But the base of the pyramid is attitudes, beliefs and behaviors that help to create the context within the, which the abusive act takes place. If you're not willing to. At the, even at the base of the pyramid, in other words, challenge your friend who just told a, a, a really sexist joke or made a misogynist comment about a woman or women. If you're not willing to say that's not cool or I'm not cool with that in whatever way you, know, you can, then in a sense, your silence is a form of consent and complicity in his sexism. And we can't say that then, therefore, if we're gonna be silent in those situations that we're, there, that we're not participating and perpetuating this larger system that's, that's causing all this sadness, tragedy and abuse. Anyhow, that's the bystander approach. The bystander approach is, if, if done right, if done correctly, and it's not always done in, my, in the way that I think it needs to be done, it engages men in active conversation about the ways in which they participate in either perpetuating the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that, that continue to create you know, a rape, sexual assault, and abuse, and domestic and inter -partner, in, intimate partner violence, or what can they do to interrupt that and challenge that and be a strong man and, and make it clear to the men around them and younger men who look up to them? Uh, because that's another critically important piece. Like what are adult men doing who are in positions of influence with young men and boys, not just fathers, although that's important, uncles, you know, teachers, mentors, uh, you know, coaches, you know, uh, religious leaders. There's so many men who play in powerful roles in the lives of boys. What are they doing, those adult men, to make it clear to those boys that there are ways of being a man and being a strong man that do that not in any way involve being disrespectful to girls and women, violating girls and women in any way, uh, treating them with disrespect, or you know, emotionally, physically, or sexually abusing them in any way, and. Men can respond again, I said, said earlier, men can respond if you give them a sort of a, a positive challenge. But and one last thing about this, the bystander approach, the bystander approach is really a leadership approach because the bystander who speaks up and, and the word bystander, I use it just as a synonym for friend, teammate, classmate, colleague, coworker, family member. There's no such thing as a real bystander. It's just another way of saying somebody who's in a peer culture, small or large, and they don't have to be at the point of attack. They don't have to be someone who's 
uh, right there at the moment when an incident of violence happens, because be, to be in my sense of the word, to be a bystander, a friend, teammate, classmate, it's a 24 seven proposition. It's not just at the moment that something happens, but um, it, the person who speaks up in the face of abuse is actually a strong person who's acting as a leader. So a 15 year old boy who turns to his friend who just told a rape joke and says, dude, that's not funny. I mean, you can, joking about rape is not funny. Can you joke about something else? He might not see himself, that 15 year old boy, as a leader. He might not have any credentials next to his name that uh, suggest that he's a leader. But that act of saying, could you joke about something else, is a leadership act because what he did was he noticed something was wrong. He, he, he thought about his obligations to various parties, consciously or unconsciously. He cycled through a series of options of what to say or not say, and then he chose one and he did it. That's what a leader does. Right. And by framing the, the act of bystander as a leader, you're saying to men in a positive way, come on, come on, we need more men who have the courage and the strength and sometimes the leadership skills to break our complicit silence. And I do think a lot of men can respond to that. Well, you know, my experience with men is that they, um, they, they, want to, they, they do like to be fixers, right? Men like to fix things, you know? Um, one of the complaints that, you know, I was a therapist for many years, and one of the cl complaints that women would have is, you know, I try to talk to my husband about this, and he wants to fix it, and I just want him to listen, right? Well, you know, this, your suggestion of this bystander approach is really tying into that need for men to fix it. And I think, I think that part of the reason that a lot of good men do nothing is because they don't know how to fix it. So I think that having actionable tools, you know, that these are, these are things that you can do that can change the landscape of our culture that, that encourages violence against women. I think that that's really, really important from a psychological and sociological standpoint is that we're really connecting with, um, you know, it's almost an innate thing in guys, you know, most of you guys aren't great listeners. I'm sorry. You know, there's a few of you out there, but most of you aren't, but, but, but you're really good at fixing stuff and you like to, to know how to fix stuff. So fix this, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. I mean, if, a year, years ago, I produced a list called 10 Things Men Can Do to Prevent Gender Violence. And it's it had different iterations and it's been translated into dozens of languages, you know, and it's specifically, these are concrete action steps. This is what you can do. So there's a, I take your point. There's a general idea, like we should do something, but then there's more specifically, okay, what can you do? And I think one of the things, honestly, one of the things is listen to women. I mean, it, it, it's like it's like not just as a, I mean it's not the only thing you need to do because I think listening is an important step but it's like like one of the things one of the critiques that I have of this of domestic violence awareness month which is you know every October right or sexual assault awareness month which is every April and lots of programming on college campuses and in communities happens around those you know those months but I'm I've been saying for years we've had awareness about domestic and sexual violence for decades decades not years it's like 30 or 40 years the question is not about awareness the question is about action right. the question is are we going to hold accountable the people who are leaders in our societies in the educational space in the political culture and every everywhere else are we going to hold them accountable for actually doing something making the policy changes implementing programming and embedding sort of you know the, the training at all levels those are action steps rather than awareness and so I think listening, for example, yes, it's critical as a first step. But then once you've listened, if you're a man and you've listened and you've heard women around you talk about their experiences, okay, that's important. But then, okay, now what are you going to do about it now that you've listened, which is, again, it's itself an important act, but then it has to be followed up, I think. Yeah. So um, where can we get that uh, list of 10? We're going to link this program to it. Well, I Is mean, it it's, on website? Website, Jack, it's on my website, it's on my website, jacksoncats.com. Um, well, we will go there. And you can, anybody can just Google 10 things men can do. It'll come up in numerous iterations. Well, cool. Well, I, instead of going through those, I, I want to ask you um, another question. Okay. So I have two wonderful sons 
who were coming of age as I was producing and releasing Finding Jen's Voice. Now, they both heard more about intimate partner violence than I'm sure any of their peers did, and much more than they wanted to hear, I'm quite sure. Um, but I still wonder if they got it <laughs> and if I actually helped them understand the challenges that women face and how they could support them. So for people who are watching and listening, who have sons, who have that influential role in, in the lives of young men, how do we effectively engage them in discussions? What, what are some of the most important things that you feel like we should be doing? Well, one thing I appreciate that is a, you know it's a challenge, but I, I'd say one of the things um, that we have going for us as a culture today that we didn't have when I was a young guy is that there's an awful lot of people, women and men and others, who have been writing and making films and doing podcasts and writing books, and it, you don't start from scratch. In other words, some of us have thought through some of this stuff, and so it depends on how committed somebody is. But for example, there are so many articles and books and mm -hmm. and videos to watch. If you're a man of integrity who says, you know what, I I, I think I should be doing more about this problem. This, this problem meaning both violence against women in intimate relationships, but also sexual assault and harassment, and mm -hmm. sexual abuse and trafficking and all these things. I want to do more. Well, there's an awful lot you can learn. And if you're committed to it, you know, some people will, will learn through reading, reading books, reading articles, you know, reading, you know, watching videos, uh, going to take course, take taking a course, listening to a speaker. There's so many, so you don't start from scratch. And there is a growing movement of men. It's multiracial and multi-ethnic and global. It's small. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit that right away. It's tiny compared to what it needs to be. I mean, th in other words, the number of men involved in actively addressing these issues compared to the scope of the problem globally is it's disproportionate, radically disproportionate, but it exists. So there are men and there are initiatives all over the country and all over the world that you can tap into if you're, if you're truly concerned, in other words. And I think mothers, for example, of sons who who are, you know, somewhat thoughtful and somewhat, you know, um, attuned to, to, to some of this subject matter, those mothers can hand off to, the, to their sons. You should read this article. I would like you to watch this TED talk. I would like, you know, and then let's discuss it. So, right. so you're not starting from scratch. Right. You're, you're, you're being supported by people who have already been doing the work, who've thought through. I mean, because some of the objections that men raise are so predictable. It's, it's, I, I find it embarrassing. Some, some of the stuff that I do in my work is just stating, I just state the obvious. It's like so obvious. I'll, can I just give you one, I'll give you one example of, a, of an exercise that I developed years ago that people have, you know, implemented all over the place. It, it went viral a couple of years ago on, uh, I think it was Instagram. It got, you know, tons of tons of hits but it's an exercise where i do in in in, in, uh, in trainings now i used to do it in public lectures now i do it more in training and my people do it not just me but you, you draw you have a, a chalkboard or a, a whiteboard or two easels with flip charts you put a male symbol on one side female symbol on the other side and then i ask the men just the men what steps do you take every day or on a regular basis to prevent yourself from being sexually assaulted and I've done the exercise literally thousands of times and it, a handful of times men gave a serious answer. I mean, handful out of thousands of times, they give a serious answer. Most of the time men, it's silent or people chuckle and finally somebody says, I don't even think about that. And I say, thank you. And then I say to the women, just the women, what steps do you take every day or on a daily basis to prevent yourself from being sexually assaulted? The exact same question. And the, the hands start shooting up the list on the women's side is just, it just keeps going, right? And the board gets completely filled, whether we're in an urban area, a suburban or a rural area, it doesn't matter. There might be some slight variation based on population density, but it's really the same. And it's a stark visual when you finish, it's a stark visual reminder of just how unfair the system is because the men's side is completely blank and the women's side is completely full. And we use that as the stepping off point to have a discussion. And I, and I, by the way, I think it's important for me to say that there are some men in some situations where there's more violence. We have to talk about race and ethnicity and poverty when it comes to men and, and, and fear of violence. By the way, when men are afraid of being sexually assaulted, it's almost always, almost always adult men. It's almost always fear of other men 
and the fear of other men's sexual assault, not women's, whereas women fear men across the board, men fear other men. So that's something that we have in common, by the way, men and women, fearing men's violence. Fearing men. That's right. And it, 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 comes, it becomes kind of a rich conversation. And then men who have never thought about this, including adult men, it's shocking to me how many adult men, some, you know, some adult men have thought about it, but how many adult men will say, oh my God, I never really thought about that. Meanwhile, the guy's married to a woman for 25 years. He, you know what I mean? It's like, what do you mean you've never thought of that? It's so <laughs> obvious, but I don't mean to be dismissive. I think it's, it's a teachable moment, if you will. And then you have young guys, especially young guys, high school guys, you know, college guys, who many of whom have never been in an intimate relationship with a woman who've never worried at night when the you know, woman close to them hasn't been coming home or is, you know, they just haven't had that sort of consciousness. And some of those men will then go home and they'll ask their, or they'll call their mother or something and they'll say, mom, do you do these? And they're like, yeah, of course I do. And it becomes a point of like, oh my God. And then I say to men, it's like, then imagine if you had to do all the things that women have to do on a daily basis, right? It's, it's so, and so much of it limits your freedom of, of movement in the world. It's not just fear, it's fear that changes your options for right. moving freely in the world. Right. Um, imagine if you had to live like that as a guy, because I know, I, I can imagine, and I know how I would feel, I'd be ticked off about it, I'd be so pissed off. And then when you hear women who are upset about, sexism and you know men's violence against women instead of reacting defensively to their righteous indignation which is how some men react mm -hmm. instead of doing that what about taking a take, take a deep breath and imagine you know what if i had to live like this if i had to constantly worry about violence and abuse in relationships and the online world is another whole world where so many women don't even want to go into spaces online because of the hostility and aggression that comes their way if you had to live like that as a man don't you think you would be upset as well and by the way another way to do this as i said earlier tracy is make the analogy with race you know like instead of white people reacting with defensiveness to people of color who are righteously indignant about racism instead of getting reactive and defensive what about taking a deep breath and saying okay if i had to live with what people of color have to live with every day and being followed in stores because I'm assumed to be a criminal and and people crossing the street when they see me walking. And I mean, there's a million of them that the people of color in, in, in especially but not exclusively African-American people in our society, you, you know you would be ticked off if the, you had to live like that. And so instead of being defensive about it, when you hear people of color expressing their anger and concern, imagine how you would feel. I think this is powerful stuff, and I do. I think some some men are so defended and so hostile that they're not gonna they're not gonna let this in. But I don't think those are the people that are our target audience. Our target audience are the people who are the men who say these are issues, but they're not really my issues. Those are the people who, at the very least, have there's an open door a little bit, an open window, you know, to that so they've already acknowledged it's a problem, and now you have to help them think about how they can be a constructive part of the solution. Thank you. Um, you know, you've been doing this work for a long time. Um, uh, so you've, you've kind of watched, we're, we're generations into this, right? Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, um, are you hopeful for the future? <laughs> well, I think one of the, thank you. It, 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 it's, it's, um, I think it's important as, as a leader in a, in a, in social, in a social movement that you have to have some kind of positive vision, because if all you're doing is gloom and doom and telling people how bad the world is and how it's just getting worse. And that, then what's the, what's the point of really uh, doing anything about it and organizing and doing the hard work to change the culture if it's just futile. So you I gotta be an optimist, right? You have, to, you have to be on some level. I, I don't think, I don't think you have to be, willfully naive okay so or pollyannish about this so so i would say we have we have a lot of problems okay as a civilization we these are enormous problems but one way to think about it positively is the pace of change the historical pace of change has accelerated dramatically over the past you know half century so so for example if you take a long view of history a long view like ten thousand years of you know recorded history 
And then there's 100,000 or more of human history, but certainly recorded history about 10,000 years. The past 30 or 40 years, the changes have been unbelievable. The, thing, the things that women, for example, the women's movements, the multiracial, multiethnic women's movements have been some of the most transformative social movements in the history of our species by far. Not, almost nothing is even close, to be honest with you. And, and yet it's, it's an unfinished project. I mean, I'm not saying it's finished and it won't be finished when I die. You know, I mean, obviously we're all part of, those of us who are part of these struggles are part of a long term historical process. But the changes that have happened, even in my lifetime, in our lifetime, are unbelievable. I'll give, just give you one example. This is, this is about race, but it's re directly related. When I was um, you know, watching TV the night that our Barack Obama was elected president, I had, you know, like many people, not just people of color, I had tears in my eyes. It was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. My son is sitting next to me and he was uh, seven years old. And it was not that unbelievable to him because it was normal to him because he didn't know viscerally or intellectually how long a road it's been, like historically and, and how unlikely that event was, you know, that, you know, you know, you, you follow me? I do. Because it's just his normal experience. Right. I mean, when I was in high school, I'll give you another example. I didn't, I had never met an openly gay person in high school, never even met an openly gay person. I know that I met gay people and LGBT folks and then t folks but not when i they weren't out they didn't you know not in high school my son's grown up in a completely different world he has like out gay relatives and friends and it's like much more fluid in his sort of social circles and and it's complete in one generation in my family the change has been that dramatic right and so people will say, well, things don't haven't changed very much. They don't know what they're talking about when they say that. That's not true. Things have changed dramatically. They haven't changed enough for some people. I appreciate that. Is that does, so the point is, there is reason for optimism, because even in one generation or two, you can look and see the changes. And by the way, some of the political problems we have in our country right now are because the changes have been happening so rapidly that it's decentering a lot of people who are then fighting back, pushing back, you know, whether it's white nationalists or anti-feminist men or the movements against LGBT equality. These are people who are decentered by and put off by the rapid pace of the change. And they want to cling to an older version of what they consider normal or normative sort of traditional uh, practice or, or, or a society that they consider to be more, what, it, what they consider more comfortable or normal, but the world is changing all around them. And so that's part of the reason why we have these struggles and, and we're gonna continue to have them because anytime democracy pushes forward, anytime that you start expanding, you know, the democratic idea, if you will, there is gonna be forces that are threatened by that expansion. And so there's, it's always gonna be this tension between people pushing forward to try to be treated with respect and dignity to increase equality. And then the forces of hierarchy and dominance that are gonna to continue to maintain or try to maintain their position. And I think being aware of all this and then choosing what you as an individual are gonna do about it is one of the questions that, that a thoughtful self-reflexive person has to has to engage in in our time and i personally i'm in my experience again i don't mean to be pollyannish about this i know that a lot of people including a lot of men can initially be defensive and hostile but if they if they're at least minimally open to thinking about this stuff in a different way they get new inputs they hear from women and then they hear from other men who are similarly struggling with what to do and how to be a better person I, you know there's reason for hope Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, um, I, I really, um, I, I'm also an optimist. Um, and I think you have to be to, to work in this field. Um, I'm so grateful for your leadership in this field. Um, and for the movement that you've inspired to um, get men involved in women's issues, um, and to really make a difference. Um, you know, I recently heard uh, Simon Sinek describe faith as knowing that you're on a team, even if you don't know who the players are. And I feel like that's what this podcast is kind of all about. It's gathering the many people out there who are all on the same team, fighting the same fight, striving for the same goals, and bringing some of them, like you, Jackson, into our conversation. So I want to thank everybody who's listening for being on the team. And thank you very much, Hope, um, for facilitating this podcast and 
Um, very grateful, Jackson. I hope you'll come back and visit us again because we have so much more to talk about. Thanks so much. And be sure to pick up your paradox. It's eye-opening. So we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tracy. This has been riveting and dynamic and really emotionally charged. So I appreciate from the incandescent perspective to bring fabulous Jackson Katz to our show. And we do look forward to continuing conversation and really trying to get men involved in this very dramatic fight for equal rights. So you are listening to the Voices for Change radio show with wonderful Jackson Katz. This is Tracy Shot Show. Check out her website, voicesforchange.net. You can stream her video, her award-winning documentary, not a video, Finding Jen's Voice. So we thank you. We look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Central, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Mitt Mountain, Jackson's Eastern, Tracy's Eastern. So we are Eastern time today. Thank you all. Be well. Stay, stay, stay safe. <laughs>